All right, guys. Well, thank you for showing up on time. Thank you for taking time out of your business to add another element, another layer to your business, to the knowledge that you're going to gain to help you become a better real estate agent, a better investor, a better developer, whatever the reasons that you're here for. Thank you for taking the time out to do it. We're very lucky to have Leo Adamondo here today. He's developed some of the biggest, best projects in the city, and you may or may not have known about him. So he is one of the smartest guys I know. We've been friends for five or six years, and he's going to tell you about some of the strategies that he uses in his company, and hopefully you'll learn some cool stuff today. So without further ado, Leo Adamondo. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I uh, almost didn't make it. Spent the better part of the last hour stuck in an elevator in West Philly. Mm. So I broke one of my own cardinal rules, which is don't get in old rickety elevators that you don't own. So yeah, I was I get the doors pried open. It was terrible. <laughs> with seven people, one of them was my partner. I wasn't very happy with it. So um, good. So this is a this is a presentation that I'm walking through, which is one that we use for investors. Uh, we kind of pulled some things out and shows what we do. Show some deal vignettes, and then at the end, I just have some talking points. Um, try to leave it open for questions the last like 15, 20 minutes. Unfortunately, I have a three second flight, so I have to leave at 2 o'clock. Um, okay, so I'm Leo. I grew up at Tenth and Locust, so not far from here. Um, I left when I was when I was younger. My parents got married, divorced, we moved to the Midwest, and I ended up back here in 2005. Uh, while I was in Boston, um, I decided I was going to get into real estate. I had previously worked in other industries, and I bought some property here. And, uh, made mistake number one in development, which is I thought I could buy something in one city and fix it from another city. So, anyone who thinks you can you can do real estate you know remotely or by joystick, even with all the cool technology we have now, it's very much an on the ground, hands on business. Um, so the business was uh, was started in 2004 when I was in Boston. It was called 806 Capital. 806 is the it's my college street address. Uh, very sophisticated at this point in time that. Google, uh, we, re we changed the name in 2012, I guess, to Altera. Um, there are four partners in the business, uh, myself and three others, and we have about 50 employees. Uh, we do everything in-house except for construction. Um, we, do, we do some of our own you know, oversight of general contractors, of subcontractors. We don't have a general contracting entity arm. Some you know, builder developers do, we don't. But we do most of our own deal sourcing. Uh, we do all of our underwriting. Uh, we do most of our own financing. We don't self-finance most of the projects, but we, we don't usually use mortgage brokers. We usually you know, go, we go with lenders that we know, which makes us a little bit unique. Um, most developers um, will engage you know, financing brokers along the way. We try to avoid that. We'll talk about that later. Um, we have our own project management, property management, and so I guess we're, we're sort of vertically integrated, except for the construction piece of it. Um, Construction is, uh, is something that a lot of developers you know, end up getting into. Either they start there or they end up there because they want to have a little bit more control of the whole process from buying a piece of land or a building all the way through, you know, renovating it and obviously leasing it up and, and, uh, and managing it. We just don't do that. Um, we've done you know, a lot of real estate transactions over the past uh, you know, 13 years under the 806 capital umbrella and then under Altera. Um, residential, retail office, senior housing, industrial, hotel, pretty much every sort of real estate. We went to hospital for a small period of time. That was a total disaster. Um, that was really, that's a whole other business, obviously. Um, we, we, didn't, we didn't do well there. But we work with a lot of large um, institutional investors, and we currently have about 2,000 apartments. They're mostly in Philadelphia, uh, somewhere in Pittsburgh. We own a uh, complex of buildings in Pittsburgh. Actually, the original Heinz Ketchup Factory and all the kind of associated buildings uh, there, we own that. And the buildings we bought them, they were already renovated. They go by the names of meat, potatoes, um, beans. Uh, I don't know why we didn't change that. We bought the buildings, but people seem to like it. Um, we have a couple, maybe you know, two, three dozen properties uh, today, depending upon if you count, you know, five buildings that are kind of managed together as one asset or, or five assets. And we, you know, we've generated good returns for ourselves and for our investors over the last several years. Um, this is more of a slide for investors, but you know, really. We're looking for uh, good business plans, off-market deals. Now, off-market does not mean there aren't brokers involved. Okay, so most of the deals that we do, in fact, have a broker involved. They're just not actively listed or marketed. So, you're, you're all uh, real estate agents in some capacity. I don't know how much, much, how much of your business is listed business versus you know a seller who's not really a seller, but he might sell to the, in the right situation. You know buyers who are looking for that kind of property. 
that, in my experience, is where most of the money is made in real estate. Not necessarily residential sales, but in, in the commercial real estate business, a lot of trades without ever getting actively listed or, 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 or brokered, even if it was a broker involved. So we, tr we look for those kind of situations. Um, and um, we try not to buy something just because we like it. We try to buy it because we like it and we have a de definite plan of what we're going to do with it. But a couple of situations, including a hospital, where we bought something because we thought it was cheap and we thought you know, it had a lot of things we could do with it but without any like, really clear plan or path of what to do with it. Uh, we, we got cleaned out. So we try not to do that. Uh, but we do like you know, exit optionality, which is a fancy way of saying you buy something, you have a business plan, and the business plan could be two years, it could be 10 years. Okay? And there are, there are, there are exit points early, you know, early on in the life cycle and, and very late. So if you have to pull the asset through a downturn for some financing reason because you, you, you have some hiccup along the way, you're able to own the asset, cash flow it, and then you can sell it you know, a decade later. Um, and then just try to understand that's on the first slide. Um, so, obviously, we're based in Philadelphia. Uh, we focus on Philadelphia. Uh, these are some of the kind of marketing bullet points that we, um, we try to talk to investors who don't know Philadelphia um, or um, maybe know it but don't really think of it as being kind of a, a first class place to invest. I don't know if you saw it, but there was an article yesterday, the day before, saying that Philly has the fastest wage growth in the country. Okay? Not to be confused with job growth, because we still lack even places like Pittsburgh in job growth, but uh, the fastest wage growth in the top 20 MSA. So I think that's a good sign. I mean, I think there are lots of good signs in, 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 in the Philadelphia marketplace. Um, obviously, I'm biased, you're probably biased because you guys operate here, this is your livelihood. But this is speaking more to the, to the non Philadelphia based in, in, in investor universe here. So stable plant based, as in meds, actual job growth and wage growth, so I'll update this. Um, it's a very affordable city. Uh, Notwithstanding a lot that's been read and uh, written and, and said uh, in the press over the past maybe six or eight months about the housing crisis, the housing affordability crisis in Philadelphia, that's a nationwide issue, by the way, not Philly issue. Philly is, is actually a relatively very affordable place to live. It's the fourth or fifth most affordable city of the top 25 MSAs if you look at um, you know, median incomes and the cost of housing, and, you know, the rent ratio, the, a lot of the ratios that your, maybe your clients' lenders look for when they're loaning. Uh, a lot of those ratios are actually very positive in Philadelphia. Particularly relative to Boston, D.C., and New York, which is our, our, you know, not our peer, but our proximate coastal cities. And then, um, you know, institutional equity demand. There are actually a lot of out-of-town investors, both small investors and large investors, who have, now have Philly on their radar um, and are, are interested in, in hearing more about the marketplace. I mean, we've, we've seen just in the past 12 months dozens of people come from all parts of the world and all parts of the country and landing in our office who you know couldn't have found Philadelphia on a map ten years ago? So that's that's a good sign, I think. That helps. That, that helps. That's a rising tide for everybody. Um, one of our main themes as we think about leaving Philly, and we, we do actually have property today in, in Pittsburgh and outside of Nashville. We actually have own property in Boston until recently as well. Um, one of our main themes in, in sort of travel, taking our business plan on the road. Um, you know, as you get further away from home base, you don't have the um, institutional knowledge of you know the real estate brokerage community. You don't have the municipal relationships for you know zoning issues, permitting issues, all the stuff that you know kind of gets in the way of, of making money in our business. Um, you got to be really thoughtful about: Am I going to Baltimore? Am I going to Cincinnati? Am I going to New York City? And why am I going there? Right. So the theme we've created is this as a meds theme, which is obviously Philadelphia based uh, as a strategy because Philadelphia is really an meds and meds market, but it actually translates really well to other places. Um, you know, those places on the, on the slide, but. Places like Cincinnati, St. Louis, Cleveland have a really strong, even though they're not necessarily cities you would think of as being metro, you know, cosmopolitan and having a lot of growth because they're kind of old Rust Belt cities, they actually have a really good stable job base because they have great universities, there are, there are lots of them, and there are some quality universities, they have great hospital systems. Um, another interesting thing too is if you look at where the art museum ranks, you'd be shocked to see how, how um, how well respected some of the art museums are in places like Cincinnati, which is the fourth best in the whole country. Okay, the guy who runs the Philadelphia Art Museum, Timothy Rudd, used to be the the curator, whatever the director of the Cincinnati Art Museum. It's a really well respected art museum, and that actually is an interesting ind indicator of you know embedded kind of socked away wealth in a, in a market that just needs some sort of catalyst, some sort of spark to kind of start reinvesting back in their own community. And you know what's happened over the past. 
five or ten years is this whole reurbanization where what you see in Philly with all the buildings being renovated and, and infill development, that's also happening in Pittsburgh. It's happening in Cincinnati. It's happening in Baltimore. It's happening in St. Louis. It's happening in Cleveland. These are places that we've actively looked at over the last few years, you know, following our heads and beds team. Um, so what does that all mean? We basically do three things as a, as a, as a, as a company um, on the investment side. We do a lot of things you know, to support the investment side, you know, asset management, property management, reporting, project management, financing, sales, all that kind of stuff. But the three types of projects that we look for, the three types of investments we look for are core plus, industrial, and development. Okay? So value add apartments is, sort of, is, is our core plus strategy, and that is buying well-located, um, I would say, not C level apartments, but generally they're B level, B, B minus apartments, uh, but they're in, in, in B plus, A, A minus locations. And trying to not bring them up to the top of the market, but bring them up to nicer than where they are now, but not as nice as the nicest, most expensive apartment you can rent in that sub market. So um, these are two examples. We own the Pepper Building, which is uh, around the corner here on 19th and Lombard. Um, what do you? How many of you uh, have have rented or have done some investing in apartments before? Okay. So when somebody says, "Hey, I'm, I'm thinking about buying this lot and building ten apartments. What kind of rent can I get?" If it's in the Rittenhouse area, what do you what do you what do you say to them? What, how, how would you how would you advise them in terms of what what residential apartment rent? You know, assuming normal size apartments and normal apartment mix, take all those variables out of it. What do you think the rents are in, in kind of Rittenhouse? Anybody? Three dollars. Three dollars. Okay, so um, I would agree. You know, they go from two hundred and fifty to you know three hundred and fifty, three hundred and sixty, depending upon you know what the building is. Um, so, what do you think the rents should be at the Pepper Building? It's at Nineteenth and Lombard, three blocks from the square, right? And again, normal size units, normal unit mix. Okay, three dollars. Three dollars. Okay. If I told you the units are a lot of inside bedrooms and, and maybe the units are on average a little bit bigger. So they're 800 square feet versus our, our portfolio is about 720 square feet across the, across the board. More or less than $3. Right. Less. Less. Okay. So this building was a hospital. It was part of Graduate Hospital, went through a bankruptcy uh, in 1997, and then being bought by Penn Health System, it's now a rehab center. And they eventually sold off the original hospital, which is the Pepper building. Okay. Um, was bought by PMC, the largest residential developer, quite largest developer of any kind in the city. Okay, uh, they renovated it. Started about nine years ago, delivered it seven years ago. Could have been ten and eight. Um, they sold the building to a pension fund in 2011, 11 or 12. Um, when they sold it, the building was at two dollars and change. Um, I actually looked at the, the book that uh, I think CBRE put out when they sold the building uh, years ago. And when we bought the asset um, last year, uh, last September, it's been almost a year, the building was at like 225 a square foot. Nothing wrong with the building structurally, okay? Um, it probably needed a little bit of a lobby face, like even though it had been done you know, eight years prior, it, was, it wasn't a great you know, lobby. When you walk in, you didn't sort of feel like you were in a class A building. Um, and the elevators were never renovated. So they, they spent all this money renovating the building and they never fixed the elevator. Elevators were always down, and people were getting stuck. You know, it's not familiar. Gets getting stuck on elevators all the time. So there were some problems with the heating. So we came in and you know, we bought it for fifty-five million, fifty-four million, something like that. Um, we came in in the first six months. We placed the boiler, we fixed roof leaks, we fixed some facade leaks, we fixed the we overall the elevators completely, and we fixed the lobby. Okay, the rents are now two forty a foot, right? I don't think they're going to go to three dollars a foot because the building, you know, whatever. It's a few blocks off the square. It's you know, there actually are people who will not rent in one nine one four six. They want to be in one nine one three. So it's you know, blocks south of one nine one three, and units are some inside bedrooms and you know, some bigger, some bigger floor plans. So even at two seventy five though, right? It's still a great, still a great asset at a great price point, you know, for for a renter. Um, so that's that's the kind of that's the formula we look for, right? Good asset. It needs some work, not you know, not a lot of work, um, and you know it's well located. And there's, it's there's some reason why it's why it's renting at a discount to what what its peer set should be. And some part time, part of the reason is, is management. You know, we manage pretty well. Part of it is like just fixing basic things that turn tenants away. Right. Every time you rent an apartment, whether I rent or you rent it, 
someone's getting paid to rent an apartment, right? My rental cost is probably lower because I have an in-house team that does the renting, does the uh, leasing, but it could be 400 bucks, it could be 600 bucks, it could be you know $2,000. It costs a lot less money to retain a tenant than it does to get a new tenant in there, right? Never mind the downtime of turning the apartment, right? So we try to do things to our buildings right away to help retention as the, as the number one. First thing we do is, how do we keep tenants, right? Next thing we do is, whatever plan we have to like, you know, raise rents and you know, improve the, the asset, we try to get all that done, you know, try to buy in the fall, and if it's a light renovation job, have it done by the spring, so that you don't miss the next leasing cycle. People come in, lobby's done, every apartment not like, might be finished, but the lobby's done, the elevators are done. When they walk in the front door, they have the experience of, of being in a Class A building, right? Take them to a renovated unit, right? If they if they want to see what it looked like before, you show them that. But really focus on you know the experience that they're buying into, not the not what you not what you bought you know the year prior, six months prior. And then we did our first suburban Philadelphia uh, transaction in February, we bought uh, Winwood Park. It's a ten acre site. It's right across from the Winwood, Winwood train stop, uh, next to the Whole Foods and the, and the Giant. Um, it was owned by the same family since 1941. The, uh, the grandfather built it uh, during World War II. Um, he built a lot of apartments in the area, by the way. Um, and this is what he kept. And the grandchildren were running it. And as soon as the, the, as soon as the last um, second generation here passed away, the seven or eight grandkids uh, they sold it, and we bought it. It was, a, it was brokered. Um, you know, we didn't we didn't steal it, but you know, we looked around and we said, "There's ten or twelve apartment buildings in this sort of Winwood area, and the, we were by far the the cheapest, right? Right across the street is a thing called Maybrook, which was which was built by a New York wife and a local developer, Hamford. It took them twelve years to get the approvals, but it's a beautiful Class A building. It's got a pool, you know, covered parking, you know, the whole nine. They're also getting like three and a half thousand dollars for a two bedroom. We bought when we were, we were running two bedrooms for 15, 16, 1700. So a huge gap between you know where we were and where they were. Just trying to take that gap maybe 30, 40% of the way there, not even halfway there, right? By placing the kitchens, putting in central air, putting in a dog run, putting in a gym, putting in a kid's playroom, doing stuff that doesn't require emptying out. And there are 30 little buildings that have you know kind of six to 10 apartments in each building and kind of doing it building by building by building. Do the amenities first and start in some logical sequence, you know, renovating building by building by building and get cash, keep cash flow there. So try to keep it, you know, 80, 85% occupied. Bring new tenants in, start to sort of prove out the theory that, so if I can take a one bedroom from 1200 to let's say 1700, initially just with the unit renovation, it goes from 1200 to like 1550. Okay. And then, as the electric comes online because we're putting new service, then you can turn the AC on, right? And the next year, you have 1,600. And then the dog run and all the grilling stations and all the amenity stuff that you do comes online the following season. And then that becomes 1,600. And then with natural rent growth, you know, over a five-year period, 1,600 becomes 1,700. So that's the sort of math that we're, we're trying to solve to, right? And also along the way, trying to keep as much cash flow in, in, you know, in place as possible. Uh, this is a project we did in North City. This is the northeast corner of Third Market. Uh, we bought 11 different uh, parcels or buildings from six owners. Five owners and a trust. The trust had, the trust had five six owners. I said we gutted it out. We started talking to the guy who owned the shirt corner, Marvin Ginsburg. He, owned, you know, he had four buildings in his store and he only owned three of them. His estranged you know, cousin owned the one in the middle. So we had to get him on board, right? And then there was, there was bar, uh, borrowed with uh, a not Lily. Um, what, what, what did Auburn know? It was an old city. Um, uh, there was a, there was like a, there was like a like a dance report. Lucy, the dance report in the bar, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's in stores. So, yeah. Lucy's, and then there was a, an old eyeglass shop, and there was a piece of land, and there were buildings behind as well. So we settled it all. It was, it was a buy right zoning once we had all the parcels together, and um, you know that's that's what. That's what we, we still own it. We, we got our original investor out. Um, we still own it though, uh, partner. Um, we do these triple net uh, developments. And this is like part of the part of the um, development business. This is these are the deals that we do when we're only doing a deal because we have a tenant in hand. Okay, if we didn't have a tenant, then we wouldn't do the deal. So we built 
a new medical center right on the corner here at the Bazzoni Center. It's right over there, um, County Corner. Um, we have CVS uh, in Society Hill, which is opening up in October. And then we've done a bunch of Wawa's. Uh, 22nd and South is the most recent one that we have developed. Um, and then industrial. This is the one that probably most folks don't know we do. Um, we buy industrial properties. Uh, we bought, you know, maybe half a dozen. Um, we're buying dozens more uh, this year, next year. Um, we really like certain kinds of industrial, um, not necessarily warehousing. Uh, warehousing is what a lot of people who were traditionally in the industrial ownership and development business have migrated to. So that's like, um, you know, Amazon distribution centers, FedEx facilities, just the moving of goods. Um, we, look, we look more for outside storage. So crane yards, truck yards, tank yards, places where large uh, equipment, whether it's involved in logistics or in infrastructure, those are two categories, it's where the, where the stuff sits either overnight or when it's idle. So, and there's, in most municipalities, there are, there are, there are there's a distinction in the zoning code between outside storage and, um, and, and logistics or, or transient storage. So most municipalities look at it as five days. If the stuff moves every five days, then it's not considered outside storage. It does move every five days and is outside storage. And a lot of, um, a lot of the properties that, that we look for are, are in places where the municipality, the county, the city, whatever township, would rather it not be outside storage. They don't want to look at you know, industrial equipment sort of sitting out there for months, weeks, in some cases, years at a time. Um, so they're trying everything they can to sort of like squeeze that use to the next township out you know, further away. But if you think about it, a lot of this equipment has to come into the city on a daily basis, right? To service your needs, whether it's a crane pick, you know, or a bulldozer, whatever it is. And the further it gets out from the city, the more expensive it is for you to rent it, right? So there's this tension between where the equipment needs to end up to do its job, where it can be hired out to, and, and where it currently sits and where it will sit over time as, you know, as these closer in locales, you know, get built up the way the city's getting rebuilt. So, it's an interesting little tension. Um, so we do this nationwide. Um, all right, some case studies. This is uh, 1616 Walnut. Uh, we bought this in February of 2012. Uh, I remember Dean Adler said to me, you're absolutely crazy, you're gonna lose your shirt. You should never pay $29 million for a building. Um, we did pretty well. Uh, the timing was good though. And we, we had an 89% leased office building. We did buy out 52 tenants, and some of the other leases naturally, naturally expired. We gutted it, we put Santander Theory in the ground floor, PT Adventure behind, an architecture from the second floor, uh, CKO kickboxing, and core power in the basement. Um, the basement actually was a, was a really well-known, nobody particularly old in the room, but a really well-known um, lunch place back in the day. Uh, I forgot the name of it now, but do you, you just remember Horn Hardit? Yeah. Okay. It was like that you walked in and had like, all the food was like in little slots in the wall. You, you know, open the slot up, pull it, eat it. Probably that was big in the 50s and 60s. Um, so this place was, was, was sort of the biggest one of those in the city. Um, along the way we discovered, uh, if you look at the uh, middle bottom there, that old, all that wood paneling you see, most of it we didn't know was there when we started doing the renovation of the top floor. We found it as we started just peeling away, you know, flooring material and, um, and sheetrock and, and plaster patching. Um, that was actually John Q. II's um, Pied-à-Terre. So the building, 1608 Walnut, was built by Sun Oil, which was part of Standard Oil. Sunoco is the successor company today. Um, the Pew family, the Pew Trust, and you've heard of them, it's a big charitable trust based in Philadelphia. So they built an office building, and then next door they built another building for, they really didn't have a plan for it. They just, they owned the property, they bought it, they, they built it, and it, was, it ended up being an office building. And they had a, uh, the, the patriarch of the family had a, a little apartment up top. So the amenity space, one of the amenity spaces, there's two of them in the building, is his old apartment, you know, re reimagined, and that's the old dining room, um, restored uh, pretty well. That's the original floor, actually. So that was fun. Um, industrial, this is a property of Eastone in Boston. Um, this property, you can't necessarily tell, but it sits, you get a golf ball from the property to the ocean. Um, yet it's in this little industrial zone north of the racetrack south of, um, of, the, of sort of the shore towns north of Boston. And it's one of the last places that a crane company could go and, and still be half an hour or less from downtown Boston, which is what it need to be you know, to service the clients. So we bought this in April of 17, 
sold it in May of 18 after putting our tent in it. Um, this is the corner of 18th and Market, the southeast corner. We bought a 1980s office building um, and did the lobby, the awning, fixed the facade, um, fixed the elevators, put a bunch of tenants in it. It was half empty when we bought it. Uh, and it's now, I guess, 90%. We sold it to a local 1031 investor uh, a couple months ago. This is Mazzoni. You guys probably know where this is, right, right around the corner. This was actually a state welfare office for like 25 or 30 years. And you can't tell from this, but the state welfare office was um, occupied the first two floors. And it was never meant to be more than a two-story building. It was not structurally ever, ever envisioned to carry any more load, even a roof deck on the roof. So we actually had, had to build a, a, a two-story addition on top, but not support it on the existing building. So this is actually two separate building systems that look like one building. We drove 80 helical piles into the ground, which are these big screws that literally like go into the ground to, to basically build a new set of columns that came all the way up and just sort of sit as a platform on top of the old welfare building and then built the two floors on top of that. Uh, so it's an L-shaped two-story building on top of a, of a rectangular two-story building. And this is their um, medical centers and Walgreens in there. Uh, they do, um, Missouri does uh, LGBT health and, and welfare, job placement, um, they have a small food bank. They're one of the largest nonprofits in the area that services that community. They get like 15 or $18 million a year in, in, in funding from various sources. Uh, they do a lot of good in the community. So they were a tenant of ours years ago at 12th and Chestnut, and they moved out of our building so they could redevelop it. And I promised the lady who ran the organization until recently that if she was ever ready to buy her own you know, building, once they had some funding to secure that we would help them. So we, we bought it, we renovated it to their specifications, and they bought it from us and using some, some tax exempt financing. Um, we got paid in this bit. Uh, this is the upper building we talked about this already. Heinz Law. So we own uh, five buildings in Pittsburgh. This is two of the five um, beautiful old uh, warehouses, uh, actually factories that Heinz used to make all kinds of products in. And um, this building we bought. About a year and a half ago, um, it's on the North Shore part of Pittsburgh. This is on the same side as Heinz Field and, and PNC Park, the ballparks. It's about a mile walk from Heinz Field. Um, it's on the wrong side of the river by traditional multifamily standards. So if you go right across the river, um, the rents are 225, 250 a square foot. And on this side of the river, we bought this at 150. Now it's like 160, 165. But it will always be a low cost alternative for anyone who is commuting north or you know, doesn't mind walking 10 minutes over a bridge to get into the sort of more happening part of town and doesn't want to pay the same rent or just wants a significantly bigger apartment. So uh, we, we like this and we like Pittsburgh a lot, actually. We're doing a eight, $9,000 renovation, you know, kind of before and after. New flooring, actually painting the kitchen cabinets, which makes them look totally new, putting in you know, granite countertops and nice sinks and appliances that are stainless and new lighting, and, and the rent's go up. Uh, this is the Wawa that we just built the 22nd and South. We originally bought everything in that picture except for the Omega Pizza uh, beer shop on the corner. And after a few years, we bought the beer shop and we knocked it down and we built 20 apartments on a Wawa, um, which are pictured there. Hopefully, I'm going to be part of the uh, bike protest a few weeks ago from there that made the, made the press. Um, okay, we're going to do some quick lessons learned. Um, and I, I, this will be tongue in cheek. Things I don't teach you at Harvard. So <clears throat> I went to Harvard Business School, it was great. I had a good two years, I met some good people. But you don't learn much in business school about the kind of the nuts and bolts of, of really anything, particularly about real estate. So these are the five things I've uh, picked up over the last I don't know, 12, 13 years. Um, you can read them and we can talk about them. Um, some of them are meant to be you know, humans in, in, in some respects, but I'm serious when I say all these things. So. Uh, the real estate business, as you, for you who haven't done it that long, maybe you haven't encountered it yet, but for those who've been doing it for a while, it's a lot of really dishonest people in the real estate business. I would just encourage you to not become one of them because it's too easy. You know, you say that, well, if I, if I act honorably and, and the next five people don't, you know, I'm going to end up on, on, on the short end of it. And you will once in a while. People will do things, say things, you know, that are just not honorable, and you will end up losing out on it as a result. Do not go to the dark side. It is not worth it, it is not worth your dignity, it is not worth not being able to sleep at night. So try to you know, go about your business in, in an honorable way, and so don't be a shark, okay? Doesn't mean you can't make money, doesn't mean you can't be shrewd, but 
People say it's a gray line between shrewd and dishonest. I don't think it's a gray line. I think it's a bright white line. Okay, you know when you're doing something or saying something you shouldn't be doing it just to make an extra buck. Just don't do it. You don't need to. Good, fast, and cheap. Um, this is a, uh, say a hard lesson learned in hiring other folks to do construction for you. But it applies to more than just construction. You can change the words from good, fast, and cheap to, to something else. In business school, they said, you know, there's a job function, there's location, and there's industry. Okay, you can't have all three. If you want them to be in healthcare, marketing, and be in San Francisco, right? If you can get San Fran and healthcare, take it, okay? The idea here is that every major decision, particularly in real estate, there's three important things you're looking for. You gotta figure out which two of them are the most important and get those two. If you ever think you're getting all three, your chances are you're not gonna get any of them. So, I had a contractor years ago who was good, fast, and cheap. And as it turned out, he wasn't good, he wasn't fast, and he wasn't cheap. Because he cut corners, and as I say in the office all the time, the longest distance between two points is a shortcut, particularly in construction. Okay, so be smart about you know the, be smart about the decisions that you're making, and just think about am I am I getting the, the two of, of the three most important things in any decision, and make sure you get it. And if you're not getting them, then then you're not making the right decision. If you think you're getting all three, then you're definitely making the wrong decision. Okay. Um, this is the third bullet point I learned uh, through the downturn in 07 and 08, and you know, kind of got lucky uh, that we had picked good financial partners rather than the financial partners who at the time had offered us maybe the best economic arrangement. So when you're thinking about, you know, for those of you getting into the business, eventually you're probably going to end up going to look for investors to, to help you finance some of your projects. So be talking to equity investors. Okay? Some guys are going to, girls are going to offer you, you know, really good economic terms. Okay. The better the economic terms are to you, chances are the shorter the lease you're going to get from that investor if something goes wrong. Time delays, zoning problems, financing problems, you can't find a buyer, whatever the case may be. Because for them, the more risk they're taking, right, the less patient they're going to be. So we always try to balance you know, reasonably good economic terms with our, with our investors with investors that we think, we don't know until things go bad, right? are gonna be there and they're gonna act honorably when the shit hits the fan, because it will hit the fan, okay? Hit the fan in 2008, it's gonna hit the fan again. I can't tell you if it's gonna be this year, next year, the year after, the year after. It will get ugly, okay? It happens every seven to 15 years in the real estate business. It's like the immutable law of gravity in real estate. So, things are good now, okay? They will get bad. When they get bad, who are you in business with? Who are your financial partners, right? Who are your business partners? And are they going to be there? Are they going to act rationally? Okay. Are they going to put money up when you need money to, you know, finish a construction project or carry a project or whatever the case may be? So, really place a very, very high value on good partners who are going to be there when things go bad. Okay. Real estate is a get rich slow business. There's a guy named Richard Green who is the chairman of First Trust Bank. Um, he's a, just a you know. A really good guy, um, very influential in, in the local real estate community. If you ever dealt with First Trust, he makes pretty much every loan decision there. His grandfather founded the bank. His father then took the bank over. His father's still alive, actually. Um, and then he's now the chairman and CEO of the bank. He told me this when we were playing golf about five years ago. He's like, just remember, you're in the get rich slow or get rich really slow business. And everything you do, every time you try to like accelerate you know, that wealth creation process, you're probably taking more risk. And if you do that enough times, eventually it's gonna be poorly timed. So just think about you know one foot in front of the other and really like just going about it in a measured, slow way. Um, and then think forwards, but always remember to look backwards. Um, I mean, this is not, we probably do, talk, do teach this in business school, but um, this is something we try to do. Every time we finish a project, right, we always go back and spend some time looking at it and saying, okay, what do we do right, what do we do wrong? and try to make every single project just incrementally better than the last one, right? And sometimes the things you did wrong, they weren't wrong in the moment, but you don't want to do those again because perhaps the market has shifted, people's tastes have evolved, right? The, the, you know, the demographics of the area have, have, have changed. So just being really thoughtful about every time you interact with a buyer, interact with a seller, interact with a, with a, with a developer, like, you can always get better. Right? The key is to take the time to look backwards and say, okay, what can I have done differently and better? Whether you're building a house or 
building an apartment building or selling a house for someone, right? You can always do something a little bit better. And if you can just avoid making the same mistakes over and over again, you're ahead of most people. If you can actually avoid the mistakes and, you know, every, every time you do something, just do it a little bit better, okay? You just end up making more money and taking the exact same amount of risk that you were taking other ones. Um, that's it. So, um, great book. If anyone wants to be a real estate developer, it's called The Real Estate Game. The guy's name is something Porvu, P-O-R-O-V-U, I think. He was the original um, professor of real estate at Harvard Business School. Um, what was the book again? The Real Estate Game. It's a very good book. You know, it's uh, 15 bucks on Amazon. Some of you will read it and be like, I knew all, I knew all that. Some of you will, will, will pick up one or two nuggets. If I read it in three or four hours, it has some very basic, like, you know, you know, mathematical examples of, you know, really basic real estate investment and development. I think it's a really good tutorial. If you want to go from being a real estate agent to actually being in the real estate business, I think it's a really good book. Um, I've read it four or five times. I try to read it every few years just to remind myself of all the stuff about really, really basically simple the real estate business is, right? The more complicated you make it, the more that, you know, you look at, we always say, I work everything out, everything out, everything we do, Every deal ever done, I work it out in 15 minutes in the shower in my head. And I use the most basic math. I'm not a math whiz, you guys can all do it too. If you walk out of the shower, or whatever your thinking place is, and you're like, it doesn't work, and then you go and you get your computer and you pull up Excel and you start playing around with it, and it works, don't do it, okay? I promise you, don't do it. Because you can make anything work in Excel, okay? We all know that. And if you haven't figured that out, go learn Excel, Show, like, teach yourself how to fool yourself, and then unlearn. Okay, because it's really it's bad. So it's a simple business, and the more you the more you make money in a simple way, you know, the more you can avoid some of the pitfalls of, of, of real estate development, ownership, you know, being a good real estate agent, whatever you uh, you you might in the business. So that's all I have. Questions. <laughs> I am not a good negotiator. Um, that's true. You know, some people really like thrive on the art of negotiation. Um, I, I, I really don't like it. It's probably the part, part of the business that I that I like the least. Um, I, I always want to walk away thinking I got a good deal, but that the other person felt good about it too. Some people will say that uh, a good negotiation is defined by both parties being pissed off. Okay. I don't know. I don't, I don't think that's like, that's not my that's not our philosophy. So. Um, like with rental properties, it's hard now because everyone thinks their property is worth more than it probably is. Um, I think what you really got to be, you really got to be careful of, is deferred maintenance and not not being overly aggressive with how fast you think the rents are going to grow. Particularly nowadays, I mean, rents are probably growing a little bit more now than they were a year ago, but the real rent growth happened from 2010 to 2016. Like you won't see that kind of rent growth, I think, until the next cycle. So, I would just be really careful not to not to convince yourself that. That there's no deferred maintenance in the building, and that it, and rents will not grow for some period of time. So, I didn't answer your question. I don't really have any good negotiating tactics. Sorry. Does anybody? Because I can really use some help. <laughs> I will tell you this: the best deals we've done, and that we continue to do, are ones that we offer on three, four, five times, and they just come back around. We call it the boomerang. The more times you see a deal, more, in most cases, the closer it gets to the parameters that you sort of set around which you would do it. So we love seeing deals time and time again. So. I guess my tactic is just walk away. Like walk away, go buy something else, go look at buying something else, and if it comes back, then chances are it's closer to where you want it to be than it was when you were looking at it the first time, second time, third time. Okay. What kind of challenges did you see when you expanded geographically? Like something you can't go and see and feel every day. But I imagine there's challenges there. Yeah, I mean look, we've we've done development in Philly, Pittsburgh, Nashville, and Boston, and in every market there's you know, there's some township or city official that you don't know, unless it's Philly, right, because we're based here, who's going to have their way with you. So you just have to assume that there's going to be some bullshit, you know, tax <coughs> delay. And then I'll, I'll give you a little story in Boston. Actually, we're in Revere, Mass., which is just in Boston. Um, we took an old industrial building. It had been, you know, in service and actually pretty well maintained for 40, 50 years. And, you know, they came in. We, pull the building permit to, to put our tenant in there. They said, you got to change this, change this, change this. None of which need to be changed, by the way. They just decided they wanted to put new sprinklers in, new fire alarm. So one of the things he hit us with at the end of the commercial was this brand new, like, $50,000 
auto, I can't even tell you what it was. Some kind of, some kind of system that tells the fire department there's a fire before you know there's a fire. Okay, doesn't require power, doesn't, it's, it's satellite, whatever. So we put it in, okay, and we go to test it, and it won't test. So the, you know, the, the, the fire alarm that goes, goes to the township, and the guy's like, well, you gotta go to the fire department, he goes to the fire department, and he's like, I'm trying to test this. They're like, oh, we don't have our side of the system set up yet. It's like, wait a second. <laughs> we just spent 50 grand on this thing, you can't even use it? He's like, yeah, the, the city won't pay for it. The township won't, like, won't appropriate it to pay for it. So that kind of shit happens in Okay. You know, in Nashville, they're making us build a $40,000 sidewalk from dirt to dirt. Because literally, there's no, no, no development on either side of us. There probably never will be because of what it is. But we're building a sidewalk to nowhere, right in front of our property. With <laughs> beautiful landscaping. And it's an industrial park. So there's never, people don't walk around. They get run over by crane cars, by cranes. So that kind of stuff. There's always something that, that comes up. Um, you just got to put some money away for that stuff because it will happen. It will cost you time. It will cost you money. Uh, Two-part question. Did you start your investment career buying smaller properties? And if so, when did you make the, the leap to joint venture investor back project? Yeah, the first thing we bought was uh, was a 40,000 square foot warehouse. Um, we bought some land next door, probably bigger than we should have bought early on. Um, and we had some investors, uh, a couple of friends of mine, and it was a uh, it was a real learning experience. We bought it with zoning. Actually, I bought it from my uncle. It was his old office. Okay, I bought it with zoning, with plans, with a general contractor, and he wouldn't sign the loan, he, I had to sign it, but he got me the, the financing too. Over the, a 10 year period, the contractor went bankrupt, the zoning got appealed, and the, the lender sued me. Okay, that was my first project. So, I mean, we, we, we started doing large, actually we started doing larger projects, and then we started picking off smaller ones, which we could just do without investors, with with some more friendlier lenders and just without as much brain damage. So as, as you, look, part of it is what do you like to do? If you like, you know, like renovating row homes, then renovate row homes, you make a great living doing that. If you like building skyscrapers, then go figure out how to build skyscrapers, right? If you enjoy adaptive reuse versus new construction, then focus on adaptive reuse, okay? Me personally, I like old buildings, but they're a real pain in the ass to, to develop or redevelop. And there's always stuff that comes up that you, you may have done it a hundred times, the 101st time, you'll see something for the first time. Every old building we renovate, something happens where, like, well, we haven't seen that one before, okay? So you just have to assume it's gonna happen and budget for it, time-wise, money-wise. If you like doing new construction, it can be more predictable, right? But it has its own pitfalls. So you get sort of more municipal, you know, oversight, and more layers of approvals you have to go through when you start digging into the ground. And I got news for you, it's only getting hard there's more taxation, more regulation, more everything uh, than there was two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. Um, you know, there are now like 16 different sign-offs you need, I think, to build family. It's not good for your investors. It's not good. So do what you like doing. You know, try to do it proper, properly if you can. Um, I don't know how many units came on last year. There was thousands of units. This year, thousands of units. It seems like my limited rental experience that rents are not going up, but if anything, they're stabilized or going down, especially like older units. So I'm wondering, do you think, with your crystal ball, you don't have, would you continue to buy these big projects, or do you big projects in the corner, or do you can take a break? No, we're, we're continuing to buy and build. If we're being, you know, if we had assumed, let's say the hyper market, we assume 3% rent growth kind of forever, you know, in a five cap exit, we're probably assuming one, one and a half percent rent growth, and you know, five and a half, six cap for apartment exit. And if it's still in its laws in our investment parameters, then it's still a good deal. Um, look, it's like stock market. Trying to time the stock market is historically a really bad, you know, really bad strategy. You invest money, it goes up, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. But over a long period of time, if you have a really long time horizon, which you should in real estate, it goes up, right? So. Real estate is similar in that regard. So I think if you're in the apartment business, you just keep building and renovating and buying apartments. And you just try to make sure that, you know, along the way, you don't get caught up in, in it thinking that the assumptions you made three years ago are the same as the assumptions you're making now. And that the deal that would have worked three years ago works now because chances are it, it won't work. Even if you think it works today, it probably won't work in two years. So we're actually relatively bullish. Um, we're trying not to build the nicest apartments uh, anymore. Built some really nice stuff, and that part of the market's pretty frothy. 
um, a lot of competition. If you have older units, you got to invest in them, or else the rents are going to start to go down. If they're just going to move out to a new product. Um, but we've been pleasantly surprised over the past six or eight months. We've seen rent growth. We've seen, you know, vacancy go from vacancy was two percent, you know, 14, 15, 16. Then it went to like six, seven percent in, in 17. Now it's back to like four percent, which is kind of I mean the market. I think the long-term market average is six percent. Um, so in a downturn, you know, it would be 8%. This is for well-located, you know, class A, B, multi. Um, you know, now it's more our portfolio. Our portfolio right now is in 3.5% uh, region. I just looked at it this morning. But I'd say most people who have the vintage and, and location of apartments that we have are probably less than 5% right now. Some might even be 100%, but for, you know, turnover structural vacancy. I have a similar question, just you know, as you see the market, are you go up, are you having more trouble finding deals, and what are you doing to adjust aside from maybe concerned about the sort of underwriting and the operational We're definitely spending more time looking at more deals and passing on more deals, passing once, passing twice, passing three times in some cases until and if they ever get to, you know, we want to buy them. The industrial business was in part an outgrowth of not finding good opportunities in residential and development. Um, big deals still pencil pretty well. Um, they do, just because there aren't that many folks who can, who can pull them off and you can kind of get control of the land and get your handle around the approvals. There are still a lot of good commercial tenants who, who don't have presence here or have pocket presence and, and want to sort of fill out their market coverage. And so, you know, we're, we're more focused on the development side and building a project around some kind of retailer or commercial tenant that we know we can secure before we have to spend too much money, you know, committing to the project. And that way you kind of bring your risk, your risk profile down, and you're really, you, know, you kind of you sort of convince yourself you break even at, you know, 80% of market rent and 10% vacancy, which would be tragic in terms of market conditions, right? Just based on the commercial rent. And then if you get more like market conditions, you know, four, five, six percent vacancy, you get like 95% of current market rents, then it's a profitable project. That's one way to do, but you've got to take the risk profile down. Um, and the bigger the project, too, you get you know you're forced to use a bondable, you know, probably union general contractor. And as much as that hurts because it's expensive, it also significantly reduces the risk that you as the owner are taking in the execution of the construction. You almost say to yourself, you know what? I know it's going to get built, okay? And so if I know it's going to get built, within a reason, I have a commercial tenant that help will show up, okay? Then I'm kind of breaking even, and I'm rolling the dice on can I rent 50, 60, 100, 200, 300 apartments on top? That's the kind of risk that we're, we're willing to take. And financing it properly, too. So if it takes five years you know, to get the thing totally leased up, then it takes five years. You still own the asset. At the other end of the rainbow is a profitable you know, investment. Can you talk a little bit about how you calculate your Three to five percent of non-acquisition costs. The bigger the project, the smaller, you know, the percentage. Um, that's pretty standard. Um, most of the times, you get paid half along the way and half when you're finished. That's how most banks want to do it. That's how most investors want to see it. Um, we tend to be fee light. Uh, a lot of folks will charge more. We try to take more back end if we can. Uh, that kind of aligns interest with the with the um, investor more. But, but also, one is ordinary income and one is capital gains, right, long-term capital gains. So tax profile is better. So you can make more money in a more tax-efficient way, and you're betting on your own business plan and your own ability to execute it. Feels pretty good. But you need some fees, and we've got 50 employees. got to keep the lights on, too. So you're always balancing those two. On average, over the lifetime of your career, how many deals do you underwrite before you see a successful one? So we counted this morning the number of LOIs we sent out in the past 12 months, okay? If we have an LOI on the street, we've done some amount of underwriting. We close about 10% of the deals we offer. So if an LOI is an offer, okay, about 10%. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that means we look at a lot of deals or if we issue too many LOIs, I don't know. <laughs> we need terrible major league batting average, but it feels pretty good. You know, that, that number's gone up significantly. You know, the, the closing rate's gone way down in the past two years. It used to be like 30, 40% of all the LOIs we ended up buying the building or buying the property. But now because 
sometimes, you know, the broker comes and I'm not sure this guy will sell or at what number. Okay. Put a model together, pick a number, it works, put the yellow eye out there, and sometimes I don't even respond to it, right? So that includes those kinds of like real kind of flyers. Yeah, um, we had a lot of uh, construction risk and recourse out there in 2007, 8, 9. Um, we have very little recourse out there now. There's a lot of uh, debt fund money available. Maybe not, maybe not when you're doing small projects, but when you're borrowing 20 million or more at a time, especially as you get above 50 million, the perverse thing about, about the, the real estate lending business is the bigger the loan, the less they really care about the sponsor and, and the sponsor's recourse, because they figure if it goes bad, like the sponsor's going to hide all their assets and it's going to be, you know, it's going to be important. So you actually take less risk the bigger the projects get because you're taking less recourse off. So we have almost no recourse right now. Most all of the projects that we have have some sort of completion only guarantee, and most of the projects have some bonded general contractor involved. So sure, if they go bad and the bond won't pay and finish, then I got to finish the project, but. A lot less risk for significantly more kind of development and, and investment volume. So, what we had honestly, what we did is we just did bigger projects, did bigger projects, and, and, and finance them with less leverage and more equity. And the leverage is, is you know, has very little of any recourse attached to it because the shit will hit the fan again, and it'll, it'll everyone in this room will get affected by it. So, just got to make sure that when the next buying opportunity comes, right, that you're still standing and you're not, you know. Out of business, which you know, happens. We'll see. Half of you may not be here in four years if things roll over. Real estate business is very a lot of turnover, particularly in the residential agent side. Of it, right. Right now we're kind of at the top. So, the question is, are you going to be here? And, and do you like doing it? And are you going to be here financially and, and mentally? You know, whenever things get dark. The good news is when they get dark, it means we're that much closer to them getting really sunny again. So. Is anybody shaking their heads? I wasn't looking this way. Is there one going to be here? Everybody's nope. Good. Everybody's good? Yeah. I hope you're all here, by the way. I saw that happen last time. Yep. Um, there's a lot of people developing in Philly right now. You guys have um, uh, kind of you know, come to the top of having done some great projects. What would you say are the one or two things that you do really well that separates you from others? I think we take, we managed to figure out if the project is really viable without spending a whole lot of, of actual money before we begin committing resources to it. So I think for, for us, you know, and 95% of the time when we think we can do X, Y, Z, it turns out we can do X, Y, Z. We miss sometimes and the you know, plan changes for better or for worse. But so I think we're really good at the pre-development, you know, figuring out what the thing is going to look like, whatever it is, well before it ever becomes that, uh, being pretty, pretty accurate along the way. Um, some people get really caught up in wanting to do everything themselves, like construction, okay? Um, we made a decision not to do construction. The two biggest mixed-use developers in town are Pearl Properties and PMC. They both do their own construction, okay? And they're really good at it, okay? And it's one of the competitive advantages that they have. We're not good at it. We're not going to be in that business. Um, I think we're probably better than they are. I think I know we're better, better than they are at the management. Our management company is strong. We've got good people. We pay them well. We do everything, you know, the leasing, the management, the maintenance, the turnovers, all that's done in-house. We've got really high um, retention rates across the portfolio. We have a lot of people who refer tenants, tenants in, people who transfer from building to building. You know, we've seen people over the last 10, 12 years go from a $1,000 apartment to a $3,000 apartment. You know, they, they were single out of college, they got a good job, they got married, they had a kid, all right? And they've moved to a bigger place in our portfolio. We get a lot of people moving around the portfolio, which is, which is nice to be able to accommodate folks when they don't want to leave the building, but life circumstances have changed. They need more space, less space. They need more rent, less rent. And so they, we can move them inside the portfolio. So that's been good. So management's probably, I think, the thing we do best as I think about it. Do you have any grasp on like, when it makes sense to start your own management company, whether it's 20, 50, 100 units that you own? Like, when does it start to, where you're losing money or paying someone else? So we lost money until we had about 500 units. We, we probably brought it in-house at about 250 units. Um, 
management businesses, unless you're just in the management business, management business is a tough business, it really is. I mean, you're kind of in the business of ruining people's lives. At least that's how most people view it, right? Because when you're doing your job, no one says thank you, but when they think something is wrong, like you're, you know, pipes burst and roofs leak, and even if you do everything right, you're gonna have angry tenants once in a while. So um, I think 500 units is really like when you owe it to yourself to bring it in house. 250 is where you can, if you're, if you're actively involved in the management yourself, or like if your spouse is or your sister is, and you kind of have a, an HR, you know, cost of HR, cost of payroll advantage, you can make it work. Um, our business, our management company, you know, makes money now, but you know, it's got almost 2,000 units. Um, so, 200 to 500 units, somewhere in there. There are some decent managers in town that do small, do small, small building management. Um, there are a few in between, but there are some decent, decent managers out there. Maybe one or two questions. I know you have yeah, to go. one more, and then I gotta go. Or not? All right, good. Thank you. Well, cool, thank you. YouTube live.